Sandy Sturman, my colleague, was supposed to be giving this um, presentation, but unfortunately other um, commitments have prevented him from doing that. As you can see, there are a large number of people involved in this project, um, which we've been undertaking for three years. Um, basically, the, um, the, the team at the top here are the meteorologists, and um, Amber Parker and myself um, try to put some viticulture and relevance into the information that they're providing. There are large spatial and temporal variability um, in the weather and the climate within many of our vineyard regions and we're aware of that and we've heard a lot this morning about how this influences both the quality and the quantity of the grapes being grown. To understand the potential impact of climate on viticulture in regions of complex terrain, it's important to investigate this sort of variability um, at quite a micro scale. We need this to be able to manage future risks to our wine industry. Physics-based um, modeling will enable us to provide a good handle or get a good handle on fine scale variability. But unfortunately, unlike um, Earl and Greg, very few vineyards have got a good record of meteorological and phenological observations. And I commend Earl on his presentation. I thought, where's he gone? I thought um, if we could get more growers to do that sort of thing, we'd make great progress in our wine industry. So the question that we asked was, can mesoscale numeric modeling help us to understand this vineyard scale um, and the variability within. This is the sort of model that meteorologists use. They have um, columns. Uh, these are three degree um, spatial um, columns which are, are interacting between each other and then you have a vertical column that is influenced by things like the humidity, clouds and temperature. We're familiar with these sorts of models or the output from these models because these are the sorts of things that you get on the weather forecast each night. And we know how reliable that is. Um, this particular model updates every 30 minutes. And we've used the model to simulate the local weather conditions um, in a complex terrain, both for short-term weather forecasting and for an, an understanding of the longer-term variability. We've looked at the uh, major influences in the local weather, caused by sea breezes, hot winds, cold air drainage, etc. Um, we've analysed this relationship in relation to the grapevine response. Here's New Zealand, long skinny country, 34 degrees south to 46 degrees south, and you'll notice that uh, vineyard areas are predominantly on the east coast protected from the, the, um, the, the, the winds that we get from Australia by these mountain ranges that run through the, um, the, the, the middle of the country here. So we're sitting in a rain shadow basically. The vineyard regions are dominated by Marlborough of the 35 or 36,000 hectares of grapes, Marlborough currently grows 23. And apart from the central Otago, as I mentioned, we're predominantly down the, um, the east coast. Huge seasonal variation um, in um, temperature. Here we've got on the bottom here um, mean um, growing degree season temperatures uh, from 1992 through to 2014. Interestingly, a warm season in Gisborne to the north here is also reflected in a warm season in central Otago. So there are overriding climate factors that are influencing this, this variability. But generally, as you move from north to south, um, we get cooler. I'm going to now focus predominantly on the Marlborough region, mainly because that's where I come from, um, but secondly it's um, where the home of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc is, uh, which is probably what we are most famous for. As I mentioned, 78% of the vineyard area in Marlborough is Sauvignon Blanc. So when we talk about uh, Marlborough, we talk about Sauvignon Blanc. When we talk about New Zealand, we're talking about Marlborough. It doesn't mean that other varieties are not important. Um, they provide that sort of, you uh, know, sequa, the, the fruit salad that is um, the joy of being involved in the wine industry. 
The region is basically two valleys, the Wairau Valley to the north here, the Awatri Valley to the south, protected from the north by this range of hills and also by the Southern Alps to the west. There's a lower range of hills in between the two valleys and then to the south here, you can't see them, but there are some quite high mountains there getting up to 3,000 meters which protects this region from the other predominant wind, which is the southerly. It comes up the south coast, bounces off um, the Kaikoura Mountains here and heads straight into Wellington, which is about here somewhere. Um, yeah, great, you know, give it to our politicians. They can keep it. The Wairau Valley um, is basically divided into two regions. This one to the north, alluvial soils, um, quite young soils coming down the Wairau River here. The differences on our soil type is predominantly the proportion of stones in there. Um, the, uh, the, the soils are quite young um, and decreasing stone proportion as you move towards the coast. In the southern valley here, much older soils, but again alluvial. Quite different to the Arwatry Valley, um, which is um, a windblown loess overlying a papa um, impervious rock base. The blue circle here, just to give you an idea of distances, that's 70, meet, no, 70 kilometers in diameter. So basically what we're looking at is a vineyard region which has got three very distinct soil type areas, but all within a very small um, uh, geographic area. As part of the project, we had an established meteorological network, weather station network, which are the black dots. We supplemented that by the red dots um, to increase the sensitivity of um, our um, the validation process um, by using um, these, these, these stations. So these stations were used to validate the, the um, intensity model. It started off by at the 27 kilometer grid and we basically worked it down to one kilometer. I keep saying we, it's the royal we. I didn't do any of this. Um, added to this, we have a high resolution domain that takes into account the, um, the mountain um, ranges. So, short term forecasting and the analysis of the vineyard scale. All of this information, in actual fact, and the, the, the data that comes out of it, can be found on um, the web page here, wineclimate.co.nz, which Andy and his team are maintaining. This is the sort of output that that model is giving. These are one hourly updates in weather um, over, a, a period, over a day, basically. On the right hand side here, you can see the temperatures and you can see the differences that are happening on an hourly basis. If we start here, no wind, dots, then we get a little bit of an easterly coming in and then it turns around to the nor'wester and the temperature builds up. Um, you'll also notice that the maximum temperatures that are achieved are quite different depending on where you are on the wire air planes. This is a nighttime event. This is a frost event and probably the worst frost that we've had on the wire air planes for a number of years. I want you to watch the purple bit. You see here, see how it comes out into the valley? This is caused by cold air drainage coming out of these southern valleys. Uh, a doc we call it a Dr. Muller frost and hits this um, area here um, at the mouth of the Waihopi Valley, the confluence of the Waihopi and the Wairau Valley then here. Other frosts that we've had this year hit this area here, um, predominantly um, uh, more, this, you see we've got a southerly coming through here. That was a reflection of, a, of a, a westerly that drift that came down the valley and this area here was called. So this sort of information enables the growers to identify where to put the helicopters if they're going to do some frost protection. You don't want your helicopters over here if your frost is going to occur there. We only have a hundred helicopters. It makes a lot of noise. Like you said, we do have 12, 1200 wind machines um, but they don't cover the uh, 23,000 hectares, unfortunately. Looking at the warming side of things, um, this is the um, accumulated degree days using um, Amber Parker's GFE, Grape Blind Flowering Verizon model. 
it's got a threshold of zero, so it's not growing degree day space 10. It starts on the 29th of August, which is equivalent to the 1st of March in the Northern Hemisphere. And again, you can see that there are quite significant differences in the accumulated degree days in different parts of the, um, the, the Wairau and the Awatli Valley. This northern part here tending to be slightly warmer. However, we talk about averages. If I have one foot in the fire and one foot in the fridge, I'm at average room temperature, but I'm not terribly comfortable. And one of the things that we do notice in New Zealand, and particularly in Marlborough, are these changes in temperature that are occurring during the growing season. Now this is a growing degree anomaly. So here we have the long-term average in the dotted line here. And if you just focus on that red solid line for a moment, you can see that the season started off cooler than average for that time of the year. The lower the line is, the cooler, the later the season is. The higher the line is, the warmer, the more advanced the season is. The slope determines what's happening at that time of the year. So it started off cool, then we had a warming period, then we had a cooling period, then we had a warming period, then we had a cooling period, and then finally we had this wonderful warming period um, that happened from the middle of January through to harvest. We ended up with growing degree days, um, which were, or degree, de yeah, degree days, that were quite similar over these four years, but they were accumulated in quite different ways. And this influences what's happening to the phenology and the development of the grapevine. Remember, we're in the Southern Hemisphere. Flowering is occurring here in mid-December to early January. And the initiation of the next year's crop is occurring at the same time. So mapping the variability um, in, in the vineyard. As I mentioned, Amber's developed this GFV model, which is um, validated using um, French data. Um, we're going to just focus in here on Sauvignon Blanc. Flowering date is predicted to occur when you've got an accumulated degree days of 1282. This is the average um, date at which that temperature was arrived um, from 2008 to 2014. And up the right-hand side here, you can see the various dates. So what that's suggesting is that in the middle of Blenheim, um, where we don't grow a lot of grapes, we were expecting it to flower on the 28th of November. Maybe if we look on this northern part up here, um, that be, might be more appropriate, the 1st of December. As you move up the valley and south here, you can see that flowering is occurring progressively later. About a two-week range on average. But we get seasonal variation. This is the 2013-14 season. And you can see that here, flowering in this area right up to um, Renwick, this confluence of these two roads here, um, is occurring in this early December period. Compare that to 2014-15, much later flowering. Now these data have been validated from phenological observations that we have taken um, at the, uh, for, for ten, 10 years or more. From a viticultural point of view, this is important. Late flowering, late veraison, late harvest. You can't ripen as much fruit. So here's your development of the grapevine. We're looking in this area here. We're looking at the flowering and the initiation period. Highly critical. Not only do temperatures at this time of the year influence the current season, but they potentially influence the following season as well. And depending on where you are in the valley, you can move this line backwards and forwards plus or minus seven days. Imagine if you're slightly earlier, you'd be flowering this phase here. If you're slightly later, two weeks later, you're suddenly flowering in this phase here. We could anticipate that your bunch weights are going to be greater here than they are there. So, we're using this to understand the unique features of the Marlborough region and the influence that um, the mountains and the environment is having on the terroir. We're looking at the variability across the vineyard regions at high resolution and using this to develop our understanding of grapevine phenology at a vineyard scale and to assess the robustness of our regions for longer term climate change.
By integrating our knowledge of the sub-regional differences in climate and integrating this into phenology models and our knowledge of vine physiology, we're in the process of developing sub-regional yield and fruit development models to assist the Marlborough wine industry. I must acknowledge Andy and his team, um, Amber and myself, and the group of the Marble Research Centre, um, huge amount of contribution from them. And also, um, we're particularly grateful to the Ministry of Primary Industries for their financial support. Thank you very much.